Good evening. Good evening. I am uh, Professor Alex Johnson, Director of the Law School Center for the Study of Race and Law, and I am delighted to welcome you to the Law School, for those of you who haven't been here before, and to tonight's uh, keynote address of this very topical and important multidisciplinary symposium, uh, Does Reparations Have a Future? Rethinking Racial Justice in a Colorblind Era. Uh, this symposium, which is co-sponsored by the Center uh, and uh, the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies and the University and Community Action for Racial Equity and the Center for St <laughs> National Studies, <laughs> and last but not least, the Woodrow Wilson Department uh, of Politics and University of Virginia College of Arts and Sciences, is very topical and very important. I think it's very topical and important because as we convene to address very important issues. Uh, we address these issues at a time when we anxiously, and I might add personally pessimistically, await two Supreme Court opinions that will determine the fate and future of two policies, one social, affirmative action, and one legislative, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I believe those come as close as possible uh, to providing reparations, uh, broadly speaking for past harms uh, imposed on individuals solely uh, because of the color of their skin. Uh, I also characterize this symposium as topical and important because even as we convene to address these very important issues, there are those currently in power, uh, political and otherwise, indeed I'm sad to say even graduates of this law school, uh, who seek to suppress and eliminate the voting rights of minorities under the guise of voter fraud. In addition, there are others who, in concert, oppose the granting of civil and equal rights to individuals solely due to their sexual orientation. And finally, many of these same individuals continue to oppress and subordinate women by attempting to control their reproductive rights. I believe, as my own personal belief, that these individuals are attempting to maintain white male hegemony at a time when demographics predict that they will soon represent a minority. But these people must recognize and understand that there are consequences for their wrongful, immoral, and maybe illegal acts, even when the current courts and legislatures fail to do their just duty to and refuse to protect the insular minority against the tyranny of the dwindling majority. To correct these and other inequities, we must turn to reparations. Reparations serve as an effective remedy for those who have been wronged even if the remedy of reparations takes place decades or centuries after the harm or wrong has occurred. I believe this is so because although justice delayed is, of course, justice denied, justice denied cannot and must not be maintained forever because that would represent justice defeated. Uh, thus, when I was asked in my capacity as director of the center, uh, whether I support and participate in the symposium, I jumped at the chance because I think you will agree with me that a cursory perusal of the program uh, supports my contention that the organizers of this conference, Professor Deborah McDowell, the director of the Woodson Institute, uh, Professor Lori Belfour, a uh, policy professor here at the university, and our own Kim Ford Mazrui, who happens to be my predecessor and the inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Race and Law, uh, they have put together a very exciting and informative program that will thoroughly address this multidisciplinary uh, topic, reparations, that will explore the cultural, legal, economic, and political legacies of slavery and Jim Crow, while also addressing the global dimensions of recent reparation struggles as part of the democratization of societies that once practiced lawful segregation and subordination based on uh, the identification of one's race or racial identification. By examining reparations from both a broad and an historical perspective, the organizers have scheduled four panel discussions for tomorrow that will take place in Minor Hall that I encourage you to attend. The panels are first, reparations in an historical frame, second, reparations in the university, third, reparations and the nation, and last but not least, uh, reparations around the globe. Uh, and although I'm excited about these panels, I look forward to the vigorous and stimulating discussions uh, that will no doubt ensue tomorrow. I'm happy to report that the symposium planners have not saved the best for last. Uh, quite the contrary, we have with us this afternoon our keynote speaker and one of the foremost scholars on the politics of reparations, 
Dr. Michael C. Dawson, who is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago and the director of the Center for the Study of Race and Politics and Culture. I could go on and on regarding Professor Dawson's educational pedigree and his many varied uh, accomplishments as an academic and as a scholar. But that info appears in the program, and so I won't repeat it, uh, because I'm sure you're as anxious I, as I am to hear what uh, Professor Dawson has to say. I was going to give you the title of Professor Dawson's talk, but sort of unnecessary. <laughs> so without further ado, I give you Professor Dawson. Welcome. Thank you, Professor uh, Johnson, for a overly kind introduction. Uh, in some ways, this talk is a return to my roots in at least two different meanings, meanings of the word. One is that for the past several years, I've tried to pretend I was a political theorist, and I've been writing about various aspects of political theory and uh, African American history. Uh, this talk is quite a bit more data-driven than many of my recent talks. Um, and second, it turns, uh, it's returned to my roots in the sense that it deals on, in at least indirect ways, uh, what some of my colleagues generally call my radical past. Uh, so, in that's, in this is, that's in both of those senses, um, this talk is a return for me to some of the concerns that motivated me in my early in my career. What I'm going to talk about today is some of the theoretical and particularly pragmatic considerations of the politics of reparation in our times. Uh, Kelly House led one of the early 20th century movements for reparations based on slave pensions in the South. And when I was reading her work and preparing for this talk, I was talking about what can political soft science offer a scholarly discussion of reparations outside the subfield of political theory, which has made substantial contributions to the debate. I recall that after my first book, Abigail Sternstrom, in a review in the London Review of Books, claimed that I was part of the largely black and, in her mind, radical doom and gloom industry. <laughs> what she meant by that was that I was part of a group of scholars, meaning some of whom are in this room, um, some of my colleagues elsewhere, who were trying to uh, opportunistically stoke racial conflict by essentially fabricating a narrative of continued racial disparities, even though we lived in a, what we would now call a post-racial society. Empirically, her claim was preposterous. Um, as many in this room have demonstrated, racial disparities exist in multiple spheres, and racial disadvantage continues to be a fact of life in the civil, legal, and economic spheres of this country. In another sense, there's something to her claim, although not what she attended by the, by the insult. When it comes to the study of race, political science, not economics, is a dismal science. In that sense, as a political scientist who studies race, I'm a part of the doom and gloom industry. What I offer today, in part, is political analysis of some of the possibilities and challenges that a movement for black revolutions would face today and some of the data presented will be presented for the first, and the analysis of that data will be presented for the first time anywhere. First, I'll place my remarks in the context of my current approach to the study of black politics and more generally the study of race in the U.S. I'll briefly discuss some of the objections to reparation, focusing on in particular some of the progressive and liberal objections to the concept. Then I present recent data and analysis on support for reparations and apologies, and probably that's the most original contribution I have to our discussion this weekend. I place these analyses in the context of the massive overall racial divide in American public opinion. I conclude with an explanation of why I believe it's necessary to have a discussion at all levels in the U.S. society about the desirability of a campaign focused on reparative justice with respect to race, despite the monumental cleavages that exist and the certainty of massive resistance to even the consideration of such a campaign. This work is derived from my Fragment and Rainbow project, which has resulted in the publication of the two books over the last couple of years and was the third in the pipeline. <coughs> the work on reparation is specifically drawn from a chapter in Reflections this theoretically and empirically considers at some depth the possibility and desirability of building a reparations movement in the, the current political context. 
Uh, in this talk, I concentrate on presenting some of the empirical findings and not so much on some of the theoretical uh, analysis that I tend to do in the chapter. There are some common themes that tie together the various manuscripts I produced or the, as part of the, with Polly, as part of the Fragment and Rainbow project. But these themes are also the theoretical basis for this talk. One is that there's a racial order that exists within the U.S. Drawing on the work of a sociologist and historian Phil Sewell, I argue that a racial order is a hierarchical social structure based on racial subordination that still shapes American politics, discourse, and civil society, and economic and political institutions is disadvantaged of all non-white populations within the U.S. It's a dangerous fallacy, I argue, and truly believe that the U.S. has become a post-racial society, despite the statements and desires of some liberal and progressive and many conservative commentators. The Katrina disaster, I've argued, was a vivid event that highlighted the continued existence of a racialized social structure in the U.S., which consistently has a negative effect on the life chances of African Americans, particularly the life chances of poor blacks. The racial order has evolved. It also disadvantages Native Americans, Latino, and Asian Americans in ways similar and different from how blacks are disadvantaged. This has been particularly true in terms of the evolution of the racial order since 1965, the passage of more expansive immigration laws that greatly accelerated immigration from Latin America and Asia, and although not as visible to some people, also from Africa and the African diaspora. While often deadly cleavage between blacks and white never defined the racial terrain as decisively as commonly conceived, it is now questionable whether the black-white divide remains the critical structural feature of the current racial order. The racial divide in public opinion suggests, however, as I'll show later in this talk, that generally, if not rigidly, blacks and whites still usually anchor the opposite ends of the public opinion spectrum in the United States. The public opinion data that will be presented in this talk, however, <coughs> undermines our faith in the sense of either a reformist, harmonious, um, multicultural, pluralist society, or a conservative post-racial America. I've also argued across these works, and will argue tonight, to a lesser degree, that black politics is weaker than it has been, and black political movements are weaker than they have been quite a while. The nature in black politics was symbolized, I argue, by African Americans' inability to influence either the national debate about how to interpret the horrendous aftermath of Hurricane Katrina or to effectively mobilize politically in New Orleans or nationally in support of the beleaguered and displaced black population. I further argue that the election of President Obama did not represent a new strengthening of black politics despite a stunning reduction in black pessimism. <coughs> a massive mobilization of African Americans in support of, of President Obama's candidacy in both 2008 and 2012. Finally, rebuilding a robust black politics, I will argue later in this talk, and more extensively elsewhere, is made even more difficult as black elites in all domains of activity and large segments of the black middle class have embraced the anti-politics and neoliberalism. I'll say more, quite a bit more about that in a bit. Finally, I suggest that the magnitude of the racial divide in public opinion that I present today is indicative of the potential for social conflict along lines of race. I start by reviewing some of the main objections to a campaign for black reparations. Many of you have done a lot more work on this than I have, so this will be a very quick review. This review helps to frame, however, the data I'm presenting on current levels of support for reparations and an apology for harms inflicted on blacks during slavery and Jim Crow. So I want to start with some of the conservative opposition to a campaign for reparations. Um, the first quote is from Carol Swain, uh, African-American professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University. Uh, the second is by Dinesh D'Souza, a well-known commentator on mm -hmm a conservative conversation on, on race and racial politics in the United States. And the third is by David Horowitz, who a decade ago was quite clearly the most visible and vociferous of uh, the opponents to a reparations campaign. 
Now, the various, some of the claims that conservatives make with regard to reparations movement in the United States are as follows. One, that blacks are lucky to be in the United States, lucky to be in America. That may or may not be true, but it's not responsive to the question of harms done to African Americans during slavery and Reconstruction. Secondly, Horowitz, among others, have argued that reparations have been paid both through the welfare state and the blood of the Civil War. First, as Ira Cash Nelson, Rob Lieberman, Michael Brown, and many others have demonstrated, the welfare programs of the first six decades of the 20th century were designed and succeeded in discriminating against blacks, leading to greater racial inequality, not less. Second, there is a social scientist named Malcolm X that occasionally quote, less than I did 30 or 40 years ago, but nevertheless, he once said, to be paraphrasing, that if you want to be grateful, blacks being grateful in the United States toward the rest of America was like being grateful to the person who had pulled the knife out of your back after they put it in there in the first place. In other words, it's again not responsive to the question of harm and restoration. And in particular, those such as Horowitz who claim that the debt has been paid, they focus only on slavery and they totally ignore the hundred years of black subordination, inequality, and oppression that occurred during the period of American apartheid known as Jim Crow. Now, one of the other arguments about reparation when there's an attack on America. Now, those of you who study much more extensively the legal and theoretical frameworks for reparation movements around the world know that reparation movements are often launched, truth and reconciliation movements are launched to bring countries and polities and societies back together, not to further divide them, to heal and bring together a polity on a firmer, more honest and just basis. Some have often also argued on the conservative side that reparation campaigns are the product of black nationalism on the left. My first response when I hear that argument is, so what? If the claims are just, so be it. But I think I could probably be a little bit more analytically precise than that, a little bit less facetious by noting the following, which is those such as Martha Biondi and others have shown that throughout the 20th century, well into the 1950s, it was often less progressive forces and radical forces that were leading the civil rights movement. That makes the reparations movement, if that is, if the truth claim is valid, is no different than any of the other civil rights or movements for racial justice in the United States. But even further than that, the truth claim is also invalid. Dr. King talked about reparations during his March on Washington speech when he talked about a blank check that was bound and we were here to collect. Liberals from the 19th through the 20th century and within the black movement also supported reparations in many different forms and quite explicitly. The demand for reparations is not just a demand of black nationalists on the left, but also a demand of black liberals. In fact, essentially all illogical strands within black politics, except for black conservatives, have at some point or other throughout the 20th century endorsed the demand for reparations. The arguments also made that slavery was a long time ago. Well, that's true, but Jim Crow was not so long ago. And I don't think I'm telling too much about myself by saying that I saw Jim Crow in practice. My parents and grandparents certainly lived through Jim Crow. And more importantly, the legacy of Jim Crow and slavery are still with us and still decisively impactful on harming black life chances today. The claims also made that blacks participated in the slave trade and owned slaves. It made the defendants that immigrants had no part in slavery or the slave trade. Again, true, although the magnitude of black ownership of slaves is often grossly exaggerated by the opponents. But the claim is against the government of the United States and corporate entities, not against a particular group of people or individuals. Therefore, all citizens would be implicated in the process of restoration and repair. And the identity of those who own slaves is therefore not quite as important. Finally, Carol Swain said, and I quote, timing couldn't be worse. She argues that in this political context, the reparations debate would stoke white nationalism. 
And indeed, Glenn Beck and Russ Limbaugh think she's right. Um, so they label plans such as Obamacare reparations in order to generate more racial resentment on the part of white Americans. Now, it's also the case that many liberals and progressives also share the concern about bad timing and the inflammation of already dangerous racial so divides through reparation movement. I'll address those two criticism um, later in the last few sections of my talk. More interesting, I find, are the objections of scholars sympathetic to black claims for justice. Some who are feminist, some who are on the left. One is Adolf Reed. Uh, a friend of mine, a fellow political scientist, has written quite a bit about reparations and more, more generally about black politics and race in the United States, uh, a political activist. He is concerned that no way, there's no way to verify or identify who qualifies as a recipient. He also argues about what type of reparations would one want. He finds that somewhat problematic as well. He says quite correctly there is no unified black agenda. Um, therefore, he's worried that any corporate entity that received reparations would have problems with both representativeness and accountability. He also is concerned, um, coming from a slightly different history of radical political activity than I did, uh, about the, the dominance of black nationalists in the reparations uh, movement. And he argues that even those who aren't black nationalists who have supported uh, reparations come from political tendencies that have long been irrelevant and it's a fancy of uh, nostalgia as opposed to serious politics. Finally, he concludes that reparations is mainly a campaign to rectify false consciousness among blacks, and he's skeptical and suspicious of campaigns to reinforce black political identity. Um, and he says that, quote, is a dead end or worse. Uh, perhaps the reader's right about the political irrelevance of an unachievability of a reparation campaign. Again, I'll address those later in my talk. But what I find surprising is the belief that a robust, that he doesn't believe that a robust democratic movement that does not cater to the needs of the black middle class can be built. Building a democratic movement that has high levels of internal contestation would be a necessary and desirable feature of a modern reparation movement. And historically, we've seen plenty of examples within black politics of democratic, highly contestable, and highly contested movements um, for not just reparations, for all sort, manners of uh, racial justice on, on behalf of blacks. It's also, um, I think, Professor Reed may not know the history as well as he might like. It's never been primarily the, the African American poor who have opposed reparation the movement, it's been the black middle class. Um, the black middle class has opposed reparations, um, whether we're talking about the time of Cali House in the early 20th um, century or later, because of a quest for respectability in the face of white hostility and more of a concern with access, with access to mainstream society and economic opportunities as opposed to economic redistribution, which has often been at the heart of many reparation uh, campaigns. Again, I'm not arguing that access to mainstream society and economic opportunity is not a just demand. Many of us in this room, including myself, would not be here if it wasn't for those struggles. But it's also been too often uh, counterposed to campaigns for ec against campaigns for economic redistribution that would benefit primarily the black poor. Excuse me. <coughs> Glenn Lowry um, has been writing recently, an, econ an economist has been writing recently quite persuasively about mass incarceration of blacks and Latinos. But he's also worried about uh, several aspects of, of a reparation campaign. He argues that it would make forging political coalitions more difficult, particularly with the growing non-white, non-black populations in the United States. He says there's no way to put a price tag on the harm done to blacks, although some people in this room have done so, or at least some, many versions of price tag. He says they're um, making amends for past wrongs supportable. What we really need is a type of progressive policy best one through making universal appeals. An argument which is not just similar to that of William Julius Wilson, and I think does draw upon that approach to thinking about how to rectify black disadvantage. He also argues that morally, a reparation campaigns would cast blacks as self-interested actors and further stigmatize blacks as they pose as victims. 
Now, unlike particularly Reed, he doesn't preclude a long and difficult discussion about the historic harm done to blacks. He just thinks that discussion should not conclude in a reparations campaign. I agree with him about the need for a discussion about historic harms and what repair and movement should be built to address those harms. I just don't want to rule out any options before we actually have a discussion. But also, more importantly in some ways, that to the degree to where the blacks become more stigmatized or cast as victims due to a reparations campaign is due to actual politics of what a reparations campaign would look like. As with many of his colleagues in the liberal and progressive center, I would argue that we can't predetermine what a reparations campaign would look like. Finally, I want to conclude with a longer discussion of some objections of Wendy Brown, which is also meant to be an elaboration of Larry Marks concerning Lowry and Reed. As I state in a book coming out in a month, Blacks in and Out of the Left, I partially agree with Brown when she argues that we must begin the process of making a historical event and outreach to the present, unquote. Yet there is no inherent contradiction that prevents a reparations movement or truth and reconciliation movement from taking on this role. There is no inherent reason that such movements need waddle impotently in the past. How reparations and truth and reconciliation movements unfold is a product of political contestation that takes place within the movements, of the politics that govern their development. I do energetically agree that Brown's critique well describes much of post-Black power era Black politics. A politics by and large embraces the values and constraints of neoliberalism, including an emaciated understanding of the politically allowable and feasible, a process of truth and reconciliation as messy and downy rancorous as it would be, could help us move beyond the current degenerate state of American politics to a politics that is more truly democratic. Brown also worries that identity, that the reparation politics would reinforce identity politics, which she argues is a form of politics based on weakness and thus has limited possibilities for generating progressive change. Its investment in the past and its suffering all but forecloses, according to Brown, the chance that such a movement could become the basis for a democratic future. She added that, quote, political identity leads to, as Nietzsche predicted, impotence, incapacity, powerlessness, and rejection, unquote. Identity, according to this view, becomes a substitute for action, though Brown agrees that these characteristics do not describe the civil rights movement. She is skeptical, however, about the current reparations movement, which she saw as based on own weakness, rancor, and a measure of victimization. She said, once guilt is established by an apology, by material compensation, is a historical event presumed to be concluded, sealed as past, healed, or brought to closure. The current reparations movement need not be, unquote, the current reparations, I would argue, need not be based on a politics of rancor, although it's generated plenty of rancor on the part of those who feel their privilege and comfort threatened. Redistributed justice and political power at the center of demands of this movement has advanced, as is the desire for freedom. Reparations are not about the triumph of the weak, rather they're about demand for conversation about justice. And the way that racial oppression in the past is linked to black disadvantage today and to the continued existence of an unjust racial order. Indeed, the demand for reparations is frankly associated with the demand for self-determination. Self-determination is not about revenge and definitely not about victimhood. The crux of self-determination, the key demand of the political nationalists and leftist wings of the black power movement, was a collective ability to choose a future that has the light, highest likelihood of being just, depending on one's ideology. This was a future that was often seen to be egalitarian and sometimes non-patriarchal, one where blacks would be able to govern themselves. This was a politics more consistent with Marx than Nietzsche. The demand for a discussion of reparation, like the best of the truth and reconciliation movements, is an invitation to discuss how to build a system free from domination, racial and otherwise. I left the claims about the political implications of reparations campaigns largely unaddressed. It's to these that I turn now in the second part 
of my talk, I present data and analysis about support for reparations and slavery. And here, maybe the label doom and gloom is more appropriate. <laughs> so being a political scientist, I have to talk about the data. So I'm going to try to do this in five seconds by not, taking, by not breathing. Um, <laughs> Two key points. One is that for anybody who's interested in either of the two key sets of data, uh, the ones connected between 2000 and 2005 by primarily me and Larry Bobo, but also in 2005 um, by me, uh, Kathy Cohen, and Melissa Harris-Perry, my colleagues in Chicago at the time, um, or the 2008 to 2010 study, which is quite wonderful, that was directed by Kathy Cohen. Uh, they're both. They're all publicly available. You can, you can talk to me if you're interested in having the data. Um, I would say collectively they represent some of the best uh, data on racial attitudes that we have for this for this century. So if you start looking at these tables, you can see that there's a small bit of difference of opinion between blacks and whites on just about everything. <laughs> Uh, whether we're talking about how warm one feels toward President Obama and at the point at that time candidate Obama, uh, whether you believe racism is still a major problem, uh, whether blacks are likely to achieve equality sooner or ever, or Latinos and Asian Americans likely to achieve uh, racial equality as well. Um, there's always a large difference, sometimes at a monumental, I'm not exaggerating, difference between blacks and whites. And usually, in not all cases, blacks and whites anchor the two sides of the distribution. Uh, I'll talk more about apologies for slavery or Japanese internment, but you can see again there's large differences between African Americans and whites, with Latinos and Asian Americans somewhat in the middle. Uh, and we see the same type of uh, <coughs> difference and split on questions of racial profiling um, and felon disenfranchisement. There's not a lot of agreement and we'll argue later that blacks and whites actually don't even see the same world when it comes to racial issues and, for that matter, economic issues, issues of redistribution, role of the state and others. So I want to argue that racial, the public opinion in the U.S. is structured by race. There is a strong evidence from the slide that <coughs> the contours of that they reflect a racially fragmented civil society and racialized publics. Opinion is racially ordered and while blacks and whites still anchor the tails of the distribution, there is no clear pattern about the degree to which Latinos and or Asians are closer to whites and blacks as some theorists claim that we're seeing a remaking of the racial order between a black and non-black um, divide. That's not found in the public opinion data. And the public the, the chasm between black and white opinion is deep and lasting. Uh, several people in this room have worked on public opinion race, and these go back well until, at least until the 70s, and I actually think from some of the work I did in my dissertation, you can find these same type of divisions in the 1960s as well. And it's not confined to racial issues. So, for example, um, on issues such as American support for American military operations in the Middle East, the black-white divide is greater than the divide between Democrats and Republicans, men and women, or any other social cleavers. Black for several decades have been the most anti-war population within the United States, and white Americans the most interventionist. Relatedly, a large, and I think this actually is much more um, critical in some ways because it talks about what it means to be a citizen. Related, a large majority of blacks disagree with a substantial majority of whites and believe that anti-war protest is unpatriotic. African Americans believe that, uh, and this is how we ask the question, that if you believe the war is wrong, you should be out there saying so. The same type of division can be found on evaluation of political uh, institutions such as the United Nations, on the size and role of government, and evaluation of political figures ranging from Jesse Jackson Sr. to Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Bill Clinton, uh, just about anyone you would want to um, name. So I'm going to continue with a probe into beliefs about black prospects for gaining quality in this and about whether racism remains a major problem. In the earlier chapter of Reflections, a book that this, or book manuscript, which was a book, um, that this is drawn from, I statistically established that racial pessimism with respect to prospects for equality for black, Latinos, and Asians, Americans is 
strongly predict a necessarily of beliefs about the continued importance of racism. Both are likely predictors of support for reparations and apologies. Now, we look at black pessimism. Starting in 1993, uh, when we first asked the question, two-thirds of blacks thought that racial equality would not be achieved in their lifetimes or ever in the United States. But by the time we get to 2005, that's grown to over 80%. Uh, massive enough. Now, something happened in 2008. I haven't figured it out. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, but black person, I've never seen a decline, decline that fast in um, that, of that magnitude in such a short period of time in any item of public opinion. Um, but it's obviously quite, quite understandable. But what's actually, I find, as interesting is that in a six-month period between 2009 and 2010, we saw an 8% increase among blacks in pessimism. It didn't, this euphoria didn't last very long. It already creeped. I wish I had money to go in the field last year. Um, my prediction was that we're going to see a slow creeping up back to the 1990s level of pessimism uh, within the U.S. We certainly see at this point uh, a growth in black pessimism, although nowhere near the levels we saw in the previous 15 years. We look at between 2000 and 2010, um, the 2000, that study was better funded than the earlier study, so we had enough money to have large subsamples of Asian American and Latinos that were able to offer the instrument, uh, survey instrument in Spanish, uh, unfortunately not in Asian, um, uh, various ancient languages that are commonly spoken in households in the U.S., um, which is a weakness of the study. What we see is... Um, there's an increase in black pessimism, there's a greater increase in pessimism among Latinos. And this is pessimism about the process for black equality, and uh, not surprisingly, when we look at the same uh, numbers about pessimism about Latino equality, we also see massive changes. And we find, found statistically that the change in Latinos is very much uh, connected to the immigration campaigns, anti-immigration campaigns, excuse me, uh, conducted in the West and Southwest. Um, in the period between 2008 and 2010. Uh, further statistical analysis shows that the belief that racism is a major problem draw, is the main drive, driver of pessimism by equality among all the racial groups, and for blacks in particular, those with lower incomes are also more pessimistic, as are um, older blacks as well. For white Americans, who are at the other end of the distribution on this question, uh, once again, the belief that racism is a major problem is the strongest predictor, but Democrats are significantly less, more pessimistic than uh, white Republicans. And in a finding that I found interesting, um, white Americans who are citizens were much more pessimistic about the prospects for black equality than white Americans uh, who are non-citizens. So going, pushing a level deeper, looking at whether people believe that racism is a major problem or not, the strongest predictors here becomes quite clearly that being embedded, if you're African American, in black information networks and black organizations and believing that your fate is into that of other blacks are some of the strongest predictors of your belief that racism is a major problem. And for once again, uh, party identification is the best predictor among whites of 25% uh, strong Democrats are 25% more likely to believe that racism is a major problem than uh, um, strong Republicans are. But low-income whites are less likely to believe racism is a major problem than more affluent whites, and white Southerners also believe that racism is less of a problem than their northern and western and midwestern uh, cousins. To sort of deconstruct further white support, please, and um, whether racism is a major problem, we would have to find out, which we weren't able to do in this study, why, the, what, is, what's, what is part of identification actually standing in for, in terms of, um, as some colleagues have suggested in the past, whether it's some form of racial resentment or conservatism or what have you, but we would have to push the analysis somewhat deeper to get to the bottom. So let me turn to the figures about opposition to an apology. As you can see, um, there's very little, although somewhat growing, opposition to an apology. Again, the key break is in 2008 among blacks. Um, there is high levels of opposition to an apology 
among white Americans. And for reference, there's also opposition, a majority opposition in 2000 to, among white Americans to, for an apology to Japanese Americans for internment during World War II. And I'll probably have more to say about that. And the second, and as you can see, that there is mixed support for an apology among both Asian Americans and Latinos um, between 2008 and 2010. Uh, but this is why many across the political spectrum are terrified of a reparations movement. There is massive, overwhelming, unshakable support, I mean, opposition to a reparations movement among white Americans in the United States. Uh, when I first did this, asked these questions in 2000, we didn't ask about Jim Crow, we didn't ask about Tulsa and Rosewood, people said quite reasonably, well, maybe it's just slavery is the problem. But, well, no, Jim Crow's a problem, too. And even when you ask about specifically about the victims of pogroms that were launched in the United States, Rosewood and Tulsa, um, it's very hard to move white opinion out of the opposition column. And when you talk about specific events and specific people. Now, this set of results actually led us in 2000 to 2008 to 2010 study not to ask the reparations question because there's so little variation among whites and we were so, we, we just didn't have any space on the study for what Michael really wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we get a lot more pers analytical purchase by asking the question about apologies in, in, over that time period. Uh, so what are some of the key factors that shape beliefs about apologies? And then I'm also going to ask, what are the differences between ethnic and racial groups in patterns of support? And as ultimately, what do the patterns of support for an apology suggest for the possibility of building a reparations movement, or even a truth and reconciliation movement that wasn't directly linked necessarily to a reparations movement? Well, I'll start with patterns again for support, patterns of support for blacks and whites as they anchored the uh, opposite ends of the distribution, low-income black Democrats who are grounded in black institutions, therefore have a more regionalized view of the world, are the strongest supporters of an apology. Uh, indirectly, we also find that exposure to black media and membership in black organizations also leads to greater levels of support for an apology. Democratic among white Americans, uh, white women who are Democrats with high education are most supportive, but low income white Americans are also somewhat more supportive as are uh, white Americans who live in the West. Given the sort of distribution of the belief that racism is a major problem, income distributions, um, and party ID, it's not surprising to see the low level of support for an apology among white Americans. The pattern for Asian Americans is striking in many ways. One is that highly educated Asians who belong to ethnic associations, who are also Democrats, are more likely to support an apology for slavery and Jim Crow. Political and civil society factors related factors affect Asian views more than for any other group. Latinos are affected by structural factors as well as factors related to embeddedness in civil society. But less fortunate Latinos are more likely to support an apology for African Americans and their more privileged cousins. So what are the political implications of the massive racial cleavages that we see with respect to reparations apologies as well as in other domains of political opinion? Contrary to the and Contra, Brown, Reed, and to a lesser degree, Lowry, I argue that despite the deep divides, there should be discussion about the desirability of building a movement for reparations and launching a truth and reconciliation process within the U.S. So, why do I think that's the case when there's such huge, um, little support among substantial numbers of Americans for even an apology, particularly among white Americans? And is, to, is such deeply ingrained resistance to uh, either an apology to African Americans or to um, reparations themselves that we did a survey experiment in 2000 where we changed the question, the, the order of the questions. Uh, changing the order of the questions on Japanese internment and black reparations or apologies for both did not affect the black um, results whatsoever. But when we asked the questions about African Americans first, 
support among whites for Japanese apology or reparations went down. So the one way of phrasing that is that bringing up the question of reparative justice for blacks decreases support for reparative justice for other people of color among white Americans. Uh, that's massive uh, moral and political dilemma. Uh, I have obviously no easy way of getting out that I wouldn't be here. I'd be doing something else. Uh, <laughs> let me first, though, before I trickle back to that question, say a few things about some of the work I've done on public opinion in Katrina that I think helps frame and put into context the results of reparations and apologies. First, Almost, as you saw a little bit of, almost any issue about race in the United States deeply divides blacks and whites. This is not specific to reparations and apologies. So when we asked a question in 2005 in October after the Katrina hurricane about did this disaster show that racial inequality remains a major problem in this country? I don't even think this was a particularly important lesson in the disaster. 90% of blacks said, yes, this teaches us something about racial inequality in the United States. Only 38% of whites agree. Second, just presenting the facts can lead to demonization of both the black population and the scholars who present data describing black opinion. A commentator for the Wall Street Journal was a bit more extreme than colleagues at the Boston Globe and New York Times when he claimed that black scholars who were reporting on black attitudes about Katrina were hard leftists, that were, maybe 30 years ago, um, that were manipulating and manufacturing extreme black opinion. But all of these commentators from all three newspapers claimed it was unconscionable to believe that race had anything to do with the aftermath of Katrina and that exposed the political pathology that dominated black communities and black indeed believed that Katrina was about race. As we saw in a survey conducted a decade earlier in the mid-1990s, there's a fundamental and bitter disagreement about the facts that the majority of white, something Du Bois pointed out nearly a century ago, about the fact that the majority of whites believe that simultaneously that blacks were less intelligent, prone to welfare and crime, and better off than whites in employment, health care, and other material indicators. This is to say that any discussion about ongoing racial disparities will provoke not just deeply conflictual debate about remedies, but equally with this disagreement about what the facts are about economic, social, and political reality in America today. I'm not trying to depress you, and I'm probably seceding, but <laughs> uh, my point is that avoiding reparation doesn't solve the problem of avoiding racial conflict at very deep and fundamental levels. Any issue we bring up, any issue that we try to address will provoke these types of, of disagreements, deep, profound disagreements about what reality is and how we should interpret and, and respond to that reality. Finally, and for, at least for me, this is the policy you know, coming out of Katrina and other surveys that my colleague in Chicago, Regina Park has done, or New Orleans, Columbia, and others as well, Many different surveys also suggest that even in this late date, blacks remain the population most open to social democratic agenda within the U.S., meaning that a reformation movement or more broad, other more broad progressive movements would very popularly find a population open to an agenda, oriented, agenda excuse me, oriented toward egalitarian social justice, particularly one tied to a politicized black identity forced around a political agenda that recognized the continuing legacy of racial disparity in support of the nation. Are we just asking for trouble? Uh, Charles Henry points out in sort of a modern version of Douglass's uh, comment about struggle and progress that there's nothing we can do to avoid a confrontation uh, when it comes to issues of race. Yes, we do know that there will be massive resistance from some populations in the United States. We also know there will be a bipartisan opposition from elected officials. In 2001, the State Department resisted any language in the meetings that led up to the World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, that labeled slavery or to say trade a crime or crime against humanity. That's a pretty low bar. Uh, <laughs> during the 2004 presidential campaign, Democrat John Kerry, labeled the issue of reparations as divisive. According to Charles Henry, political scientist, uh, recently retired at Berkeley, uh, Democratic Congressman Tony Hall reported receiving more hate mail than for any other issue he 
worked on when he introduced an, introduced an apology resolution in 1997. But why should we consider this? One, we should debate over the next couple of day whether a reparation movement would be a means to revitalize a democratic and robust black political movement or would it be a distraction. I think it would be um, help to revitalize, revitalize the black movement, but that's a debate. We should also debate whether, as in some cases in other countries suggest, racial cleavages would begin to be less toxic after public debate and investigation of the history and legacy of racial harms. And finally, ultimately, a debate over a reparations campaign must sit about around what type of country do you want to live in and how best to attain that policy in society. So if we move down this road, let me say I've got about five minutes left of comments and I'll open it up. We must rebuild a community of vigorous debate. In other words, we want to build an institution and organization that can foster a broad debate within black communities about which way forward. Those organizations have been attenuated over the past few decades. We must <coughs> shed the ideological narrowness that typifies black politics in this era, that has crippled black discourse in this period. Feminist, nationalist, liberal, leftist, and conservative voices should be once again be welcomed in black debate. We must use the rebuild institutional and organizational foundations for black discourse to hold accountable all types of black elites, intellectual, activists, and leaders. Illogical diversity will, will aid holding people and institutions accountable to black communities. Rebuilding black, black movements will entail, one, recognizing the racial disadvantage continues, as is obvious to most people in the streets. We must be willing to at least consider embracing militant politics again. We should not have to emphasize, which we have not always done in the past, the most disadvantaged of our communities, and also, as we have not always done in the past, ensure that any new moves are democratic and anti-patriarchal. We must outreach to other progressive forces, take an intersectional approach that includes not only reaching out to people across lines of social cleavage, such as those around gender, sexuality, and class, but also other issue domains such as those entailing, the, for example, the environment as well. From my point of view, such a movement should be socially democratic, and that's certainly going to be, constant, be consistent with the majority of African American skills in this day. And it should also recover the proud, proud tradition of African American politics throughout the 19th and 20th century of being a severe critic of American militarism. And finally, we should we have to remind our leaders something they've forgotten, which was intuitively obvious to the most casual observer, but I guess not anymore. Leaders cannot lead from behind. So in my new book, I look to the past in order to think about moving forward, and I call for something I call paradigmatic utopianism, which I define. I define paradigmatic utopianism as one, a utopianism that starts where we are, but imagines where we want to be. Pragmatic utopianism is not new to black radicalism. Keynes' work and that of the civil rights movement more generally was based on the utopian imagining of a much different America, one they were repeatedly told was impossible to obtain. Combined with the hard-headed political realism that generated the strategies and tactics necessary to achieve those goals. What would a reparations movement entail in the U.S.? That's a matter of debate, but it probably includes some of the following. Acknowledging the wrongs that were done and the continuing harms, repair of those wrongs which a movement can decide what the best strategy, whether it's pursuing universal programs or some other form of reparations, ultimately building a just society for all as the goal, as the quote from Louis suggests. As Melissa Noble suggests, a historic mission might lay the basis for an apology, might lower the levels of toxicity, but the evidence from the comparative from comparative examples is mixed. It's often been argued that a reparation movement will not repair, but will divide the working class, progressives, the left, or more generally inflame already dangerous divisions. This is the same response that black activists heard a century ago when they argued that various allied movements should take up, the anti take up uh, lynching as a cause or combat other forms of discrimination. We're already divided, extremely divided. Think over a century of evidence would suggest and not discussing both contemporary racial divide, political, economic, and social, as well as the historical legacy, will lead to continuing festering of the racial divide. Only by directly and painfully confronting these issues 
when we have a chance to heal. As Martin Luther King uh, argued that generations ago, race continues to be the cancer that eats at the fabric of the nation. I believe that talking about the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow in the context of continuing racial disparities and disadvantage is a necessary, it's insufficient step on the road to finally building a democratic, fully just, and egalitarian society in this country. Thank you. Until my knees give out, so we should leave another half an hour. Going out later than eight thirty. Um, I have two questions and a comment. Actually, thank you for a really interesting talk. My comment is that I agree with you about the fact that we should face our divisions head on. There's a lot of empirical research, actually, from the politics and gender literature that women's movements and transnational women's movements have learned that lesson the hard way. And I think it would probably be useful for you to uh, cite or find uh, that. My two questions, the first one is about the linkage between reparations and self-determination, and the other one is about your public opinion data. Okay. And the public opinion data, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how that division by race uh, pairs up or compares to uh, divisions by class, race, I mean, class, sexuality, uh, religion, everything age. else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then how it looks when you disaggregate it within the black community. Right, I didn't present all of that, but we've done all those analyses. So um, we run regressions that have uh, gender, various economic and education and social measures, ideology, party identification, region, other things, um, the kitchen sink, the youth, a pejorative term that our teachers uh, talk about, and dummy variables for black, Asian, and Latino. Um, including attitudinal variables like uh, black you know, support for black equality and um, belief that race, the dummy variables on race oh, just want everything. Else. I mean, just, just, I mean, it was just stunning um, how the degree to which um, um, blacks were strongly more likely than whites, Latinos were more, were very much more likely than whites to support preparation of apology. And this also applies, by the way, to um, Equations where you have uh, racism as a major as a major problem as a dummy variable and black equality and another chapter actually was running simultaneous equations where I was trying to disaggregate this all at the same time. Um, all that to say is that you don't get anything meaningful unless you disaggregate by a racial group. You don't find at least you don't find anything much interesting because you just say race is important for the first set of runs. Um, and what is actually I think disturbing politically, but also from the point of view of a social scientist, there's obviously a something, there's, with all those other things in the equation already for race, for various uh, racial membership group membership, they have such huge effects. There's something about racial group membership that we're still not picking up. Um, and I, mean, I don't think it's the melanin um, <laughs> that we're not picking up, even with the variables that we're including in these various equations. Um, then we can find, you know, some of the type of, I mean, there's huge heterogeneity in all these populations, and when we disaggregate by race, we find illogical divisions. We find um, to what degrees ones are tied to various types of civil society organizations, to what degree um, income and education affects, and in some cases, gender effects. Um, but those get, get just swamped and disappear when you, when you throw everybody into the same. I did have one other question about the reparations piece, and that is uh, the linkage that you were trying to bring With between something. reparations and self-determination. And I'm wondering if there's any empirical studies on that, because I, I was in Canada this past summer, and they have a TRC that's going on there for indigenous peoples. And it's pretty clear to me that the government is actually hoping that that is going to break the link between self-determination and reparations just by having that TRC. So I'm wondering if there's much research out there that you know about this question. I don't know if uh, much empirical research other than historical research. Um, so historically, throughout the 20th century, there are <coughs> in, in the black movements at this, at this point. 
there is a very strong link between reparations and self-determination. So if I could do this right. Oops, wrong. That's a chapter you don't want to read. Ah, the program of the Black Panther Party. Points one and three make, one is about self-determination, the other one is about reparations. The Black Panther Party is the most best known of the radical late 20th century or mid 20th century African American groups. But if you look at the program from the early, as I show in the new book, you look at the program of black organizations like the Liberty League, like the African Blood Brotherhood from the early 20th century. If you look at organizations like the New Public or New Africa, even if you look at some of the leftist organizations that come out of the new communist movement in the 70s, those organizations that have high, that are highly influenced from the, with cadre from the black movements, all made that link, whether they were nationalists, leftists, or what have you. Is that a necessary thing? Perhaps not. It's certainly been a link that's been, that one could analytically understand that if you believe a society or country is unwilling to repair the harm, then we have to talk about what political future we have with this society and country. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. And my question was about the white apology, David. I noticed there was a big jump in white resistance to white apology between 2000 and 2003. And I was thinking about how that might relate to the war on terror and our eventual invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. And is there a relationship that you have noticed or that you think might be between our acts of global aggression against a racialized other, i.e. Muslims who were racialized as being black and black, and white people's resistance to apologizing for violence that occurred in the past against similarly colored bodies and against African Americans who often think as being terrorists when they sort of asked for redress from the state? I'm not actually going to, I'm sound facetious, I'm not being facetious. When I was in my youth, the worst possible thing was a black male communist, right? And those people were the terrorists of the day, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, James Foreman. So people, even people like Martin Luther King, when he came to Chicago when I was in my teens, the mayor of Chicago says, the communists have arrived. So it was not so much whether what one's ideology really was, but that was some linkage people were making. Today, I think we're seeing, at least in terms of domestic Islam, the conflations in many minds between black and Muslim, and certainly a racial, and at the same time that Muslims from outside the United States are being racialized as well in a combination of religion and racialism that we've seen for decades in places like France. Is that tied to changes in support from our opposition to apology? I don't know. But certainly we have seen, in that same period, there was also a huge, what I would call, increase in how crude racial discourse on almost any possible question became. So it starts early in the decade with the war on terror and 9-11, and then it gets reinforced in 2008 in the Obama campaign when we start seeing all these local Republican organizations distributing flyers about the Kenyans moving into the White House with the goats on the lawn, fried chicken, various things about fried chicken and watermelons, things that we haven't seen since I was like probably five years old in terms of public discourse becoming acceptable. Of course, none of it was about race, we were told. But remember the cover of the New Yorker? I got a lot of flack from my progressive friends because I thought that was a horrendous cover that had Angela Michelle, right? Angela Davis Michelle Obama and Muslim terrorist Barack. And I was saying, that's just, and okay, they said, well, that's supposed to be satire and tongue in cheek. I said, that's not the effect it's going to have out in the world. And it is just reinforcing stereotypes in terms of political radicalization in black communities and the ability to exercise black leadership in ways that are quite explicitly gendered. Thank you.
operations has a fair chance? I don't know if you have a fair chance. I don't think any remedy, whether you call it reparation that involves uh, racial policy in the United States, has a fair chance. Absent a powerful movement demanding change around um, policies, uh, race relations, racial attitudes, and the like. So I think that um, I agree with Professor <coughs> Johnson when he said that affirmative action and the Voting Rights Act are about to, go, about to disappear. Um, I think that's probably the case. I'm not a lawyer, but that seems where I think in the political environment. I think we're going to see a lot of rollbacks in racial policies, and just like we're seeing um, uh, attacks on the social safety net that's going to have disproportionate effects on poor people in general and community colors as well, with absent um, any type of mass political movement that is at least somewhat outside of the two-party system. So, um, if you look at your table, you see that you um, maybe um, it, you you would see some differences between different people of color that would seem maybe um, more striking if the white people were not there to kind of anchor the the, the fringe end and uh, well it's not fringe I guess but anyway so my question is about um, what you see in your data uh, uh, to kind of inspire us for building. <laughs> Um, a multiracial political coalition that you know, maybe would, that doesn't have to have white people in it, of course, and especially um, sort of in the response to um, the, the way that those 2008 to 2010 data look different um, among Latinos in particular, and your um, hypothesis that maybe that's uh, responding to um, anti immigrant movements. So, are there patterns like that that you can um, expand on where you sort of see? Um, if you just, when you're looking at your data, just without taking, without looking at the white people, dynamic patterns, especially yeah. from Asians and Latinos. I think um, there's a huge limitation to this data that. Um, the, no, the, how fancy the analysis is just can't deal with, which is we don't have enough numbers to disaggregate by country of national origin. So, for example, we know there's political ideological differences between, broadly speaking, Puerto Rican and Cuban communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if I take the Puerto Rican South, does that mean, you know, what, what does that do to Latino numbers? Um, probably not much, because I mean, most of the respondents are. Mexican American uh, uh, descent, but still, there, we can't. Uh, same thing in terms of the, uh, Asian, even more so with the Asian uh, subsample. We can't get into um, one of the huge differences. There would be generational. Um, um, there's a little bit of a long history up to 1970 of, of alliances between uh, Asians and uh, Blacks and Latinos in places like New York, Chicago, uh, LA. And it was new ways of integration that broke down. So there are cohort differences in terms of how to think about um, race in the United States among almost all groups, given uh, uh, levels of immigration class as well. That said, uh, some of the patterns are, are intriguing. Um, one is that um, there seems to be some hints of a potential for black and Latino coalitions that are based particularly on economic issues. Um, and it also appears that um, Latinos at the lower end of the both educational and economic spectrum are more open to um, black racial demands, which is not necessarily something you would assume. Um, but the, the, the analysis suggests that. I mean, we want to do more before um, making that confident, but that's what, that's what the numbers suggest so far. Um, again, um, with respect to agents, again, it looks like degree to which blacks can partner with uh, Asian American uh, community organization, that looks like a pretty firm potential basis for alliances. Again, since those, again, uh, people embedded those organizations were much more, um, were at least somewhat more open to uh, black racial claims. So there's an interesting combination of sort of like ethnic alliances combined with class alliances um, that one could see the merging of a multiracial um, coalition that would probably be at least initially predominantly non, but not exclusively non-white. Ideally, what would your uh, scheme of reparation look like, and who would the beneficiaries be if, were, if, if you were to 
I'm not. Being a sister. Yeah, I, 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 I want to fudge, but um, <laughs> I've been fudging for 10 years about this. Um, I mean, what is, I know what it's not. When I gave a really, really super early in the talk from the original 2000 art, um, article um, at Harvard, Skip Gates wrote, raised his hand and said, What do I think my Mercedes? And um, <laughs> I didn't have one. <laughs> it's one year old. What? <laughs> Why do you need another one? Um, I'm not a big fan of sort of the individual ch- paycheck model. I'm much more um, find interesting, but I think we have to be innovative and, and, and experimental in versions that um, where resources are turned over to communities, there is democratic contestation with those communities, including elections, about how those funds get allocated, whether they're for crime convention in a place like where I'm from Chicago, or whether it's we strengthen you know K through twelve schools. Um, I would like to see building democratic institutions within black communities and then can make collective uh, determinants about how best to use uh, some set of funds. Would that include land? I don't think in the South how you get I mean I haven't I used to follow that fairly closely closely, but my guess that in the South you might Given the, the huge amount of theft that's been so well documented of lands that were owned by blacks way into the 1960s, if not later, um, that was both of the, what I call this unholy alliance between white civil society, the state, and corporate um, entities. Uh, a, a, that uh, I would guess that land would have to be on the table, although again, if um, Given the urbanization of blacks in the South, um, blacks in the South would have to decide, um, well, maybe we want some land, maybe we don't. But that's, I mean, my point is I want to see the democratic institutions where local and regional entities can argue about how best to use resources if they were damned. Uh, part of, um, I mean, part of, part of, part of what I didn't talk about um, in this talk is that there's, been increasing writing about concerns about uh, patriarchy and gender differences within black communities with respect to, to reparations. And again, it's these types of democratic institutions that are participatory and inclusionary that I think are uh, both part of the process of a black of building a black political movement, but also critical to ensuring that those movements uh, develop in ways that are perhaps a little bit more democratic but not somewhat substantially more democratic than they were, let's say, during either the civil rights or black power. Yeah, um, I, let me return to the apology. Um, I, I'm really deeply interested in this, right? So in 2008, something like a quarter of white people were in favor of apologies. And, and that is right on top of the time when you've got state legislatures throughout the South, as well as a majority of U.S. senators apologizing for things like lynching, and I think in the U.S. Senate for slavery or for the Senate's connections to slavery. And I'm wondering how you um, account for this sort of overwhelming um, support by politicians for apologies that, that's sort of disconnected from, from white people's attitudes. Yeah, I think we see a couple examples of that. One example is the campaign um, waged by the Japanese American Citizen League and, and others uh, for reparations for those um, interred during World War II. So one model is that you actually have a pretty effective um, movement developed that can make it less costly for politicians to, to um, actually um, consider remedies and if in the absence of such a movement. I think in the case that we see now, it's sometimes, in, particularly in terms of local area, it's, it's it may be in terms of sin as well. What is relatively a cost? Uh, what is a relatively uncostly symbolic? It's not that. I mean, again, I mean, several people have written about this, other than me, much more persuasively. Symbolic politics is not in itself bad. It's often a good thing, but it's all can also can be used, and I think has been used in the case of black apologies as a ways to avoid more pressing issues and redistribution of material resources. So I think that's partly. Um, what we're seeing now, though, again, I'm, I haven't done the work to read it. So that's, that's speculation, but that's, that would be 
I had a related, first I want to thank you, this was really terrific, a related question to Al's, which is one of the things that has always struck me about the numbers on white opposition to apologies to Japanese Americans is you did the polling after the apology had already been issued. And if one of the points, I mean, this is certainly what I've argued again and again of a reviving reparations movement is the development of historic consciousness. This seems to be a striking challenge to the idea that it does that work. I don't know what you think about that. I think partly is that for the political culture in the U.S., we've been developing, I don't know if culture is the right word, but a practice of one and done. It's like, you know, we win a victory, then we move on. Or, you know, we've done Japanese Americans, what's next? Or do we have to stop forgetting about this or actually more accurately? One, I think a useful truth and reconciliation process in the U.S. would have to be ongoing for a very long time. I mean, even if you think about the civil rights movement, obviously there's been a lot more research about the long civil rights movement. It took decades not just to move policy, it took even longer to move attitudes. And we obviously have a little bit of work to do in that area. So any reconciliation or apology would have to be part of a process and not the end point of a process. I think that's part of it. So I'm not surprised that also a lot of times these things are done fairly quietly. You know, as much as possible outside the public view. It's not like the Senate was calling for a national debate on race and then pass an apology about lynching. No, let's just pass an apology for lynching and say we've done it and let's move on to more important business. So part of what is missing is a publicness to these debates, to these processes, which I think are absolutely essential both toward ensuring decent outcomes, but also more in terms of doing democratic processes and that can endure past a single instantiation or event. Do you think it's productive to think about traditional affirmative action programs, higher education, contract set-asides, employment quotas, in the context of reparations? I think it could be thought of. I mean, I think it could be thought of as a component to remedies to harms done in the past, which if you think about reparative justice processes, then would be part of what I would consider reparations. I think the danger is, A, thinking that's the only mechanism we should think about, or B, that it's a sufficient mechanism as well. I don't have a problem per se with thinking about those types of remedies as being part of repairing harms that were done at all. I mean, the other, I mean, again, someone who has benefited from affirmative action is, I would argue, is that we also have to be very careful about thinking about which components of the population are benefited the most. So it's not that the children of the black middle class should not be benefited as part of redressing the harms of the past, but the fact that those who are from working class or poor families are hardly benefited at all, that's a major problem. Thank you for this wonderful talk. It's a very complicated issue, because at some level, when you do reparations, it kind of puts a false punctuation mark on a very complicated and difficult problem that never ends. And I was thinking about the comment you made about Abel Free's remark about the challenges of the reparation movement in that it makes it difficult to actually build a political or sustained movement around this issue. And I was thinking that if you survey folks on questions of whether they support or not support reparations, you get particular kind of results. I suppose that if you ask different kind of questions, such as would you support these particular remedies for reparations, then you would have a very wide spectrum of response. And based on the response you get, through careful analysis, I would suppose that there is a possibility of building a kind of movement based on 
uh, perceptive understanding of one of the kind of issues of <coughs> that can mobilize people. They're upon bridging the gap that Adolf Reitz uh, points to. Uh, that's part of when I'm opening my talk, I argue that what I'm calling for is a debate within the black community about whether we should take up a reparations campaign. And I'm open to arguments that there are other types of campaigns that would lead to a egalitarian, uh, socially just set of uh, non-domination oriented uh, society and polity that could get us there faster and better. And that would be great if that's, if that's true. So I'm not saying, but I, see, I don't see, but there's, there's a few things I do believe. One is that, given the history of black politics and current distribution of opinion, you have to talk about reparations when talking about black political strategy. And you just can't avoid that. And then, if that's where you end up, there has to be a way you have to figure out how to talk about it with other groups who are your potential allies. Um, second, I would also argue that uh, we cannot move social justice and move toward a democratic, just, egalitarian society in this country without talking about uh, racial, continuing uh, legacy of racial disadvantage, um, both in terms of the legacy of the past and continuing um, discriminatory and subordinating practices today. Uh, whether we're talking about a variety of market uh, practices, um, um, practices of corporation or the state. Um, one thing that's happened since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 is that a lot of the work to maintain white supremacy has moved into civil society and not, and not the state. Uh, somebody talked about this in an article called on the Jewish question, I don't remember who also was, but um, um, the, it's actually harder when the state's not the target. But also we have to have that discussion even if we don't have to launch a reparation campaign. Third and most depressing from I think a lot of our standpoint is that even when you don't talk about reparations or apology, you get the same type of massive opposition among most white Americans to any type of remedy. Um, there's a question we asked about in the Katrina survey about the degree to which uh, fiscal um, being uh, physically prudent was more important than restoring people to their homes. Um, and so the same type of massive division along race as we see with the uh, <coughs> numbers or we see with reparations. So uh, the one thing I want to urge that we be careful is that this thinking that we can avoid the sort of rancorous confrontational debates by avoiding reparations. We're going to have those anyway. Reparations may not be the best way to take them on, but they're going to have to. Um, if I could, uh, I wasn't joking about my knees getting out, but I'll, I'll take two more questions if that's okay. I, I wonder what you think about the reparations that are deteriorating economic situation with the decline in the general standard of living, the spirits of the middle class, accelerating wealth inequalities, um, what those two factors to begin with have on the ability to argue that there should be reparations for any particular identifiable subgroup. I mean, um Walter Mosley had a, a number of articles, I mean, not a, a, a collection of essays on social and political matters that I found quite persuasive. And one of the lessons I took away from um, that collection was that the starting point for discussions within groups or across groups is the fundamental question of what type of country would you like to live in? Now, we're going to have different answers to that, and we're going to have very different ways about trying to get, even when we have the same answers, we're going to have very different uh, ideas about how to get there. But we have to, A, start with what type of country do we want to live in, and then have a debate in public out loud about what that entails and how do we get there. Um, I think, in many ways, the declining standard of li living um, for all of us who are not in the top one half of one percent, it means that there's a possibility for some type of coalitions we haven't seen in 60 years. On the other hand, to have those conversations, we want to be honest about each other about what we see the problems with or between groups, and groups, et cetera. Jim, you get the last word. Okay, and first, uh, I want to make a quick announcement that um, the bus towards Central Grounds in the hotel leaves at 9 o'clock. And um, 
And then my question was, you had some data about perceptions of racism, uh, how persistent it is, and that like the South thought it was less. And I have a good and a bad story. One is, wow, that's refreshing optimism, uh, or it's stubborn and different. Um, so I wondered if you had an opinion about those different measures of, of how much people felt in different regions that I have the same two stories, problems. and I can't really tease it out in the data. Um, I have some ideas about over the next few weeks ways you might look at. I want to see what age difference, if I want to see how um, age might be related to some of that as well. I want to see some interactions between the interaction from being in the South. If you're younger and from the South, you're more likely, for example, to believe that racism will be declined. That might tell you a different story than if it's uh, older uh, white Southerners who are the ones who are optimistic. So I have the same two stories. I can't differentiate them given the data I have. Let's thank our...